I want to uh, discuss uh, living in the depot. Uh, perhaps this is the wrong title. Maybe I should have had something uh, clever like Home Depot. But uh, <laughs> as far as I can uh, come up with, living in the depot probably says it best. You might wonder why some railroad depots, especially those built by companies that serve the Great Plains, the Rocky Mountain West, and far west, contain living space for their agents and families. Or perhaps you are surprised that so many of these structures ever existed. So let me attempt to explain the whys of living in the depot and the overall living in the depot experience. Building construction on the moving frontiers and in more developed regions of the Trans-Mississippi West contained sensible, mostly prosaic commercial and residential structures. There was the rather rapid movement away from canvas tents, dugouts, sod houses, and tar paper shanties and flimsy commercial structures to well-constructed balloon frame wooden buildings. With the availability of finished lumber, whether coming from the upper peninsula of Michigan, northern Wisconsin, or from mountain stands of timber, the human-built landscape changed. And with the coming of the iron horse, these lumber shipments, often from considerable distances, were physically and financially feasible. Railroads enthusiastically embraced balloon frame structures for their thousands of new stations throughout the Great Plains and the West. While they might select prefabricated wooden shelters for minor stops, usually for the short term, they commonly erected permanent balloon frame combination passenger and freight depots that were constructed from standard architectural plans that they generated internally. Some of these buildings, which blanketed the expanding network of main, secondary, and branch lines, including ones that contained living quarters. A majority were two-story affairs with private apartments above the public space. They served smaller communities and generally functioned well. Early on, railroad companies realized that providing depots with apartments for employees and their families paid tangible dividends. The agent was essentially always on duty. Noted in industry trade journal, this would ensure the continuous presence of someone to receive service and emergency messages. An occupied station meant that an agent or family member could respond quickly to any crisis, whether notifying the local uh, law enforcement authority if someone attempted to break in and steal cash kept in the office, or valuable freight and express stored on the premises, especially beer and liquor, or reporting a fire to the volunteer brigade locally or to a neighboring community. If the railroad company carried fire insurance coverage, most didn't, it could expect a lower premium rate if its buildings were continually occupied. There were additional advantages. Railroad officials learned that married agents were usually steady and reliable. Company housing attracted and kept these preferred employees. This meshed well with the railway executive's practices of corporate uh, paternalism. Also, if housing were expensive or locally unavailable, an apartment pleased workers. And for them, the icing on the cake was that these quarters were usually rent-free, a pleasant departure from company housing that mining, textile, and other industrial concerns commonly provided. Of course, agents would be at their place of work, maybe making commuting by foot, horse, wagon, carriage, or later a bicycle or automobile unnecessary. No worries about uh, getting to the job in a howling blizzard or a blinding rainstorm. The public, too, like having an agent living in the depot. An individual who wished to send a telegram 
pick up a freight shipment, or plan a trip could usually find the agent, even if he, or occasionally she, were officially off duty. And two loafers and others would hang around the stations, even though there not, might not be a scheduled train, knowing that they could get from the agent or family members the freshest gossip about local, even national happenings. And I might note too that uh, railroad agents uh, could read and write, and there were those people in smaller communities, or even larger ones for that matter, that would rely upon the agent to read a document, perhaps a contract or some other important piece of paper. And there were some agents too who had uh, picked up medical skills. They had read uh, medical textbooks, uh, perhaps in their spare time, and people uh, came uh, to the station to learn how to cure uh, a back uh, injury or some uh, problem uh, with the stomach. So the agent was in some ways uh, the center of uh, the town's uh, population. Then if uh, a two-story depot appeared at trackside, there was the attraction of enhancing a community's image. Every small Prairie Town, for example, wanted to be a new Chicago, or at least uh, perhaps uh, a new Des Moines. A gestating Western settlement lacked much in the way of imposing structures. Likely only a grain elevator or occasionally a windmill or water tank complex projected further skyward than the two-story depot. Since the railroad station served as the commercial gateway to the community, literally its front door, something more substantial than a shack or a small building suggested a locality's permanence and promise. A double-story depot gave the impression that better, more impressive buildings would likely appear. And I quote, I sometimes wish that the railroad had put up a three-story depot here in town, noted a, a Nebraska resident early in the uh, 20th century. And he continued, that would have gotten the attention of the travelers and would have been a good advertisement for the town's future. The two-story depot here is better than the only one-story depots that you find in other places." Unquote. Railroads in the West did not invent the concept of living in the depot. Such specially designed facilities had appeared elsewhere and before the modern railway age in the United States. Throughout Europe, two-story depots with apartments were common almost from the debut of the Iron Horse. One is only to travel by train today through Austria, Russia, Sweden, or Switzerland to see the lasting heritage of railroad personnel who called depots their home. Other transport forms in America also offered housing accommodations for employees. Canal companies, uh, for example, erected cottages uh, for lock keepers and their families. While these structures were not technically public buildings, they served as integral parts of waterway operations. Railroads uh, early on, certainly in the uh, antebellum period, often used uh, existing structures uh, for uh, their uh, depots. And here is an example uh, from uh, Bethlehem, New Hampshire, where the Boston and Maine, actually a predecessor, uh, used uh, this existing uh, dwelling uh, for uh, the uh, local depot. And obviously there was uh, living space uh, for the agent and uh, his family. I might note that electric interurbans uh, often uh, used uh, existing structures, as did short line railroads. Uh, companies perhaps uh, on uh, restricted uh, budgets and uh, after all Americans have uh, embraced uh, the practical an idea means what an idea does and uh, if a house that exists near trackside can serve as a depot that is certainly a good idea. As the network of iron and then steel rail spread westward from the Atlantic seaboard, railroads embraced a variety of depots with living quarters, but the process was individualistic. 
At times, some carriers endorsed the concept while others rejected it. The Erie built stations uh, with apartments, but the neighboring New Jersey Central, Jersey Central did not. The New York, Ontario and Western liked the idea, the New York Central did not. Here's an example of uh, an Erie uh, Railroad, which uh, was located at its one-time uh, eastern uh, terminus at Pierpoint, New York, which is about 50 miles up the Hudson River from New York City. And uh, this uh, railroad uh, station was inhabited uh, by uh, the uh, bachelor agent until uh, his death in the late 1940s. And he still served as an agent uh, for the Erie. Still a pattern of sorts emerges, and it was geographical, and the pattern deals with where these depots with living uh, space uh, were found. In the states of the Old Northwest, two-story depots seldom appeared in Ohio and Indiana, occasionally in Illinois, mostly associated with commuter operations in greater Chicago, but were more common in Michigan and Wisconsin. Stru such structures were found in the more remote parts, particularly in the upper peninsula of the Wolverine State, where housing units, especially rental properties, were scarce, carriers responded appropriately. While a railroad might prefer a two-story design when needed, and the Sioux Line um, is the premier example, building several hundred of its uh, standardized uh, Class II depots, you go into a North Dakota town uh, 50 years ago and you could immediately spot uh, the Sioux Depot and you would know that this was a kind of three-dimensional logo uh, for the uh, Sioux uh, Railroad. It was not uncommon for a railroad company to uh, embrace a kind of bifurcated policy. The Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy, the Burlington for one, uh, erected single-story combination depots without apartments in Illinois, Iowa, and Missouri, but opted for double-story ones with agents' quarters along its trackage in Colorado, Montana, Nebraska, and Wyoming, and I could throw in uh, South Dakota as well. And uh, these were more prevalent uh, on uh, branch lines rather than uh, main lines. Now, some uh, companies' uh, plans that uh, were obviously typical of uh, the standard combination depot with a center office, a waiting room on one side, and uh, a freight uh, room or freight house uh, on the other. Now, this has uh, nothing to do with living in the depot, but just to show you uh, how railroads adapted uh, to individual situations. Here we have uh, drawings uh, for the Missouri, Kansas, and Texas Railroad, which is better known as the MKT or the KD, that uh, show that in states uh, where you uh, do not have uh, Jim Crow laws, that you would install a uh, Negro uh, waiting room, whereas uh, in uh, Missouri, for example, uh, you would not have that. A popular blueprint developed by the Burlington Railroad's Bridge and Building Department in Lincoln, Nebraska for Lions West yielded a 20 by 40 foot depot with upstairs living quarters. The ground floor consisted of the ubiquitous tripartite arrangement of waiting room, central office, and freight section. The second floor contained four modest sized rooms, a kitchen, a parlor, and two bedrooms. This plan provided for approximately 750 square feet of living space, yet hardly as spacious uh, when compared to many contemporary farmhouses or town dwellings. A centrally placed stairwell led downstairs to the office and a private door opened to trackside. And the cost of these structures uh, was relatively modest, usually less than $1,500 apiece. And company carpenters could routinely build them in a few weeks. Lacking basements, these depots rested uh, on usually untreated uh, timber uh, pilings. The apartment section had neither closets nor bathroom. None had electricity until the communities they received such service. 
and often not until the Rural Electrification Administration, REA, appeared during uh, Roosevelt's uh, New Deal. This is a uh, classic uh, Chicago and Northwestern, actually built by a predecessor company, uh, the Tama in Northwestern. And uh, it shows you uh, the general outlines of a relatively inexpensive uh, combination depot with living uh, quarters. Uh, note the uh, boards and batten construction, and that was a way of saving on the amount of uh, lumber uh, used. And here is a floor plan. This is not something that would be popular uh, with um, those uh, who are trying to uh, flip a house, uh, something that uh, HGTV uh, would be using. We're talking basics. We have a kitchen, we have a bedroom, we have a bedroom, and we have a living room. Where's the bathroom? Well, it's in the privy that's uh, out uh, by the coal shed out of doors. And more about bathrooms in a few moments. Uh, the Chicago, Milwaukee, and St. Paul uh, was a road much like the uh, Sioux Line in its enthusiasm uh, uh, for uh, quarters for agents. And uh, as the uh, railroad uh, operated uh, many thousands of miles of branch lines, these uh, stations uh, commonly appeared. And over time, the uh, Milwaukee Road, or the St. Paul Road, later called the Milwaukee Road, uh, built uh, this particular uh, style depot, which was uh, developed in 1901. And when the uh, Milwaukee uh, had its uh, Pacific fantasy realized, extending a line from South Dakota to Washington State that opened in 1909, you find uh, a number of these structures that uh, dot uh, the uh, landscape uh, in North Dakota and Montana and Idaho and of course uh, in Washington. And the Milwaukee uh, certainly at times, even though the frontier had closed supposedly in 1890, was building in uh, largely undeveloped areas like the Judith the Basin of uh, Montana. Another example of uh, these floor plans and of course varied uh, from railroad to railroad. Uh, this uh, is uh, a more uh, elaborate uh, depot which was built uh, by the Santa Fe uh, for uh, a cutoff that was constructed early in the 20th century in New Mexico. And it was a concrete building and it was designed in part uh, to allow uh, the agent uh, with um, cooler uh, living and working conditions during the hot summer month. And another example, this is from uh, the uh, Northern Alberta Railroad. And uh, in Canada, you find actually a more living in the depot structures than in the United States, at least in a kind of uh, per mileage basis. After all, uh, when railroads uh, were uh, being extended out in those uh, largely empty uh, uh, prairies of uh, the future Manitoba, uh, Alberta and Saskatchewan, and also in British Columbia, there clearly was a need uh, for agents' housing. And the Canadians tended to be much more sensitive, perhaps, instead of having maybe 750 square feet, they might uh, have uh, at least a few hundred square feet uh, more of living space. Here is uh, a photograph of, uh, a real photo card actually, of the uh, two-story uh, Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy, Burlington Route uh, uh, Depot. Uh, this is in uh, Republican uh, Nebraska, after the Republican River, not a political statement. And um, it is the uh, quintessential uh, living in the depot uh, structure. And uh, note that it's train time. Uh, we have the hack that will take people to the bustling uh, downtown uh, section of Republican. Uh, and uh, we have the loafers there. I'm sure I would be there if uh, I could move back in time. Uh, train time is an exciting event and probably the highlight uh, of the community. It shows you how much fun there was uh, before uh, the internet. <laughs> Although the Burlington had a strong corporate relationship with the Colorado and Southern when it acquired stock control in 1908, this affiliate, while embracing the two-story concept, opted for a somewhat different floor plan. As with the uh, Burlington floor plan, the Broomfield Depot sported two upstairs bedrooms, 
Both are relatively small, 10 by 12 and 11 by 12, and a small storeroom was accessed from the larger, uh, should we say, the master bedroom. However, the main floor contained a 10-foot, 6-inch by 13-foot kitchen with access to a small basement and an attached 12-foot, 6-inch by 12-foot, 6-inch living room. Although abutting the waiting room, the baggage freight room and agent's office, there was no direct passageway between the public and private sections, uh, surely enhancing uh, privacy. The Broomfield structure shared a main floor layout that featured similarities to what the Union Pacific used for its widely adopted 24 by 50 foot depot. The company placed living quarters in this one story building on the waiting room side and intentionally isolated private family space from public areas. The plan also provided dedicated storage space, in this case two tiny closets, whoopee, and an attic with window located above the freight and waiting rooms. As with the Broomfield Depot, there was also a small cellar. So the Union Pacific uh, was, of course, uh, conscious of what perhaps agents wanted or what uh, the uh, division superintendent thought uh, was uh, necessary. And I might note that uh, there literally were scores of uh, these depots erected uh, throughout that sprawling uh, UP system, particularly uh, in Nebraska. Station agents on the Union Pacific, or any other railroad that opted for single-story design, probably uh, were happy with the common floor plan. The door arrangement kept occupants, including lively children, from interfering with the hustle and bustle of the station at train time. Other floor plans used by railroads throughout the country. Yet the Burlington, Colorado, and Southern, and Union Pacific layouts were representative of how an agent's apartment uh, was configured. The very floor plans employed by railroads in the Trans-Mississippi West produced both positives and negatives from their occupants' perspectives. Most of all, there was the advantage of a depot apartment no matter the style. It meant free or inexpensive shelter in localities where housing might be expensive or difficult, if not impossible, to find. Station living surpassed the alternatives. Living in a cramped bunk car, an old passenger coach, hotel room, or more probably a rooming or boarding house. And if the agent moved to another, usually larger town, likely as he gained seniority, he did not have a house to sell, assuming, of course, uh, he had become a homeowner. Yet living in the depot had its negative dimensions. Rooms were universally small, we've already established that, storage can customarily limited, and occupants coped with the absence of indoor plumbing. A majority of depots never had toilets, although communities might install public water and sewage systems after the turn of the 20th century. The stairway symbolized what was wrong with living in the depot, it was what to do with a piano remembered a Nebraskan who as a child lived in several Burlington depots. My dad played the piano, but there was no way to get it up to the second floor. He did indicate that it did end up in the uh, freight room and then it was sold. The stairway itself was not only a roadblock for some family possessions, but also a general nuisance necessitating repeated climbs and descents related a former inhabitant. There was a coal house across the side track behind the depot where we went to get coal for the stove and coal oil for the lamps, items supplied at no cost by the railroad. There was a wood pile next to the coal house where my chopped wood, unquote. Water too might need to be brought from an outside pump and in large quantities for bathing and washing. There was also the daily emptying, and I assume cleaning, of those much-used chamber pots, 
if nocturnal trips to the outside privy, privy, especially during winter months, were avoided. I mean, what a choice. A chamber pot or a trip out of doors when it's minus 10 below. Whether two-story or single-story, there were privacy concerns, especially for growing families. Take bathing. Related one visitor, taking a bath posed a problem. There being no bathroom, the logical place for the wash tub would have been in front of the warm kitchen range. However, there were no doors to shut the kitchen from the rest of the apartment. Then there was the matter of noise. Residents and visitors noted that at times noise was an annoyance. A friend of an agent's family who lived in a Burlington Depot on the Lincoln uh, Billings, Montana line and a frequent caller remembered that it was, quote, very strange to live that close to the tracks and that it was, quote, quite an experience when the train went past, the noise, and the place kind of shook. The raucous passing of trains and the switching of cars annoyed some, perhaps most inhabitants. The daughter of a Northwestern agent had these remembrances. The piercing cry of the whistle, the clanging bell, the squeaking wheels, and monster locomotive itself would give you a good startle in the middle of the night and might keep you awake. A stopping passenger train always seemed to be especially loud, with the mail baggage and express being worked and the passengers coming and going. There weren't any please be quiet family sleeping signs on the platform. Surprisingly, the lack of noise might disturb a family member's sleep. The lack of noise. The wife of an agent recalled, quote, it was the silence caused by the train that did not arrive on time that was most likely to wake up one from a sound sleep. Perhaps you've had that experience. You don't hear the furnace running and this wakes you up and you listen and listen and you hope that the uh, blower comes on. A more constant annoyance than excessive noise at times was that the depot apartment during the winter months was likely cold and drafty. Wooden, even brick depots usually lack central heating and insulation. Upgrading, upgrading, if it came at all, occurred only during the final years of the depot's habitation. To keep structures warmer in colder climes and also to reduce some carriers, the Sioux line uh, famously, covered its depots with a type of asphalt siding so, sold under the trademark of insul brick. Uh, the name came from the product's purported insulating properties and the fake brick outline stamped on one side of each panel. And there are a number of houses that you can find in the upper Great Plains, uh, for example, that uh, are covered still with insul brick. It's fascinating. Other roads uh, might fill hollow depot walls with granulated rock wool. Some agents, either in their desire to winterize or for convenience, deposited unwanted papers, tariffs, waybills, timetables, and the like, and other trash behind freight room walls, specifically between the studs and the interior sheeting. Agents with uh, a drinking problem might use such space for discarding and or hiding their empty bottles. And I know rail fans, uh, as depots were being closed in the 1960s, uh, learned uh, quickly uh, that if you go into an abandoned depot, rip off uh, the bottom boards uh, in the freight house and maybe you'll find that employee's timetable or more likely you'll find a bottle of Old Crow. Just the bottle, of course. In time, companies might add storm windows and doors and skirting around uh, foundations. If they did not, agents might make these improvements at their own expense. But as the building aged, the fight against the elements seemed more challenging and it was never fully won. Summers were a little better than winters, but depots heated up excessively. 
After electrification, agents might acquire fans and later perhaps air conditioning units, but earlier agents and their families were at the mercy of the sun. The depot was smack in the middle of the rail, rail yards and the towns, and this is a quote. There was really nothing to cast a shadow. That was the thoughts of a one-time occupant. With tracks on both sides of the building, main line on one side, and sidings or team tracks uh, on the other, and cinder, wood, or brick platforms, there was little space to plant shade trees. Even if someone planted saplings, and if they survived, it took years for them to help cool the building. Although everyone in a village or town suffered uh, during a heat wave, Depot dwellers surely took the full brunt of oppressive uh, temperatures. Life at trackside could be more than uncomfortable. It was potentially dangerous. Freight and passenger trains, even on lightly dens density branch lines, could be, easily, could be especially deadly for a toddler who strayed onto the track. Older children, too, might fail to heed rolling stock being switched or an oncoming locomotive. And at time, a steam locomotive could be amazingly quiet. As a child of the depot remembered, and I quote, my mother hated the depot. She worried about me and my brother and sister. The platform and the tracks were our playground, and the trains on the main line provided a frequent serious threat and his mother's concern were real. The quote goes on. Youngsters were easily injured following when running across the tracks. I once tripped with my toes on one rail and made a one-point landing on my jaw against the other. My jaw wasn't broken, but I was in pain and couldn't eat for a while. Years later, when I wanted to reminisce, my mother would not discuss our days in the depot. She never overcame the dread of tracks and trains. Such safety worries prompted some agents to reject the opportunity of free housing. Maybe too, they didn't want the annoyance of patrons bothering them, especially when their agency was closed. And usable floor space and room configurations were concerned. If possible, they found places away from the tracks. And agents who wished to stay in a community, and if he had enough seniority to hold the job, might buy or build a house, leaving the depot apartment empty or used as a temporary residence for a maintenance away or some other railroad worker. Still, children, and parents too, at times found the station an exciting environment. After all, the depot served as that gateway to countless communities, and that fact knew no geographical bounds. It was the passing of people through the depot, whether passengers or greeters, senders or seekers of freight, express or telegraphic messages, who collectively made it such a fascinating place. Quote, the folks there at the railroad station were the center of town life. We kids were proud that our father was the agent and telegraph operator there. He was important, and so we thought we were too." Unquote. If there were circus specials, trains with politicians or troops, or chapel cars, those who lived in the depot likely were the first locally to learn about an upcoming event. Quote, my dad knew when the circus was coming in town long before the posters went up on the fences and other places in town. Residents of the depot had that opportunity to see what was happening firsthand, perhaps peering from windows of their trackside uh, home. Here uh, we have uh, a photograph of that Lowerville, Iowa station. This is uh, on the Chicago Northwestern. And I might just add parenthetically, Lowerville, uh, which is in north central uh, Iowa, a town of maybe eight or 900, uh, had three railroads, the Northwestern, the Great Western, and uh, uh, the Milwaukee. Uh, note that there is a child peering out the, the window. And as I was telling uh, Jackie some time ago, we really have very few photographs of interior views. 
Perhaps the agents were not that interested in uh, having uh, family uh, portraits. Perhaps they would take pictures uh, at uh, trackside uh, on the platform, uh, would be a popular place as we saw some of those images uh, earlier. Uh, maybe the office uh, would be photographed with dad there uh, at the telegraph key uh, or uh, doing uh, his uh, daily uh, paperwork. But we don't have many photographs. I've seen a few of uh, the upstairs bedroom, for example, or uh, even of the parlor and uh, kitchen. But you get a sense here uh, that uh, maybe it's about train time in Lorville in 1910, uh, that uh, well, let's see who's coming to town, who's leaving town. Are there many passengers? Uh, much freight, uh, LCL, less than carload freight being worked, who knows? Uh, it looked like a fun place to be. And as I said, some of the freshest gossip could be learned uh, from uh, people coming into town, particularly the uh, traveling uh, salesmen, uh, the Knights of the Grip, as they were sometimes called. Not so well remembered was that the station environment seemed conducive to juvenile mischief. I think that kids living and playing around the depot had some golden opportunities to get themselves into a peck of trouble, opined a former railroader. And he was correct if the autographical remarks of the son of a Milwaukee Road agent are typical. Born on the second floor of a depot in South Dakota, this individual recalled events from the years he spent in his railroad home. The depot was up on piling so that the platform would be level with the floor of a passenger coach. Recalled that I swiped one of my dad's cigars out of the box in his desk, smoked it under the depot. They found me three hours later, still green in other colors, around the gills. The Wells Fargo Express Company furnished a huge revolver for use when shipments of money were in the depot. It was kept in the top drawer of the ticket counter. It fascinated me. I spent hours just gazing at it, but stood on notice that I'd, quote, get my ribs kicked in if I ever so much as touched it. Something tells me he may have touched it. <laughs> I also recall that a long hose was attached to the bottom of the locomotive water tank at one end of the station platform. Somehow, I managed to get loose the end of it into the basement window of a house across the tracks from the depot. Filled it with two feet of water. I got a dusting with a real sturdy stick. Never heard if it was on account of wasting locomotive water or filling the basement. Likely a combination. For most railroad agents' families, living in the depot came to an end during the 1950s and early 1960s. Agents' options for better housing continued to improve with affordable and dependable automobiles and all-weather roads. Railroads also contributed to the chain. Carriers like the Northwestern began to close their little used rural depots after that company won a bitter fight in the late 1950s with the Order of Railroad Telegraphers, the union that represented depot agents. Similarly, passage of the Transportation Act of 1958 speeded up the process of abandoning trackage, literally, usually these uh, lately uh, used branch lines. And so these depots, here we have uh, a typical one on the uh, Northwestern after that battle was won against the uh, Telegraphers Union. We're just simply uh, left to uh, decay. And with trackage retired, a lot of abandonments start to appear after uh, the Transportation Act of 1958, in part because of changing transportation patterns, railroad mergers, we have the merger madness of the 1960s, and uh, since it was often easier with regulatory authorities to uh, get permission to close the station, well, this was done. Railroads also substituted mobile agency routes and centralized agencies for depot-based agents along the remaining trackage. 
Uh, here the uh, Missouri Pacific and the Union Pacific uh, became trendsetters. About the only legacy of living in the depot occurred when individuals bought former railroad facilities, whether originally designed for apartments or not, and converted them into homes. Usually these stations were removed from the uh, initial right-of-way sites if the uh, trackage remained active, and then they would be extensively remodeled. I suppose preservationists would say they were remodeled of some sort. Usually uh, these stations um, uh, saw carpenters uh, taking off the second uh, story quarters um, and then they would be recast as uh, single uh, story uh, houses. And a few like the uh, Broomfield uh, Depot have become museums allowing visitors to imagine what daily life was like while living in the depot. So today in the United States uh, one uh, railroad organization has estimated there are about 8,000 railroad depots that uh, still uh, stand uh, that have not had uh, true adaptive uh, uses. They're not Amtrak stations. Uh, that's not an adaptive use, of course. Uh, they've not become museums. And we do find uh, instances of where uh, a station has been turned into uh, some type of uh, new uh, facility, including houses. And just a few weeks ago, in the uh, June 12th uh, issue of the Wall Street Journal, there was a fascinating story about uh, two uh, gentlemen who uh, decided to uh, upgrade a uh, depot that had been built by the New York and New England Railroad in the late 1880s on trackage uh, in eastern New York that had long been abandoned. They bought the depot for $300,000 and then uh, with uh, $125,000 worth of betterments, uh, they made it into a spectacular home. And even though this uh, New York and New England uh, depot had uh, been a single story combination structure, they were able to uh, use the attic space, it had a rather large attic, and turn that into the master bathroom uh, with an ensuite, uh, or master bedroom with an ensuite uh, bathroom. So uh, I suppose uh, we could say that this uh, depot will be uh, lived in uh, for generations uh, yet unborn, considering the financial investment and its overall attractiveness. Well, so ends uh, my uh, miscellaneous comments about uh, Home Depot. And uh, if you have any questions or...